Um, so I'll start from the point of view that we now have access to very large amounts of um, data, tens of thousands of neurons, um, and to make sense of all of this data, of course, we use dimensionality reduction methods. So here's the classic one, PCA. Um, and the basic idea is that um, you know, the latent variables are embedded in a low dimensional subspace. And just as a reminder, the reason that we care about these latent variables is because uh, we can find task relevant computations embedded in them. Um, so scientifically, we have um, uh, a reason also to uh, look at the low dimensional representations. And something I've been interested in, in lately is thinking about how these linear representations can evolve over slow time scales. So for example, um, over learning. Uh, and I, I realize there's actually not very many methods that are tackling this specific question. So if we start with the most basic method, which is, of course, um, matrix factorizations like PCA, the idea is that you take your data matrix neurons by time and you write it as um, a sum of R components. Each of them is a rank one uh, matrix that have a, a low rank approximation to the matrix. So if you want to look over our slow time scales, um, so one thing you could do is just make a very long uh, matrix, uh, but then you lose all information about the difference between time scales within a trial and time scales across trials. So instead, another um, approach is to use PCA. Um, and here you now have a tensor for your, uh, your data, so you neurons by time by trials. Uh, and you can do the same thing, so you try to find a low rank approximation where now, instead of looking at a, a rank one matrix, you try to uh, find tensor rank one tensors, and each of those is considered um, a different component of the different linear variable. So here's an example where you have some particular on the right, some components that have some particular neural encoding, um, some uh, time coarser um, um, temporal profile that's locked maybe to some behavioral, um, uh, behavioral cue, and then you have the trial factors that could increase over, uh, over trial, and that means presumably that it's related to learning. So one of the um, assumptions <coughs> behind TCA is that then each of these uh, components is only going to change in amplitude from trial to trial. And that's explicit in the, the formulation of the tensor rank one tensor. Um, and so this is something we're interested in relaxing uh, because there are many examples where you don't have this type of structure in raw data. And so here's um, a couple of examples. The sexier one is representational drift. So you have a neural encoding that's not um, fixed from day to day, but it actually can change from day to day. So you don't have related variables in like the same low dimensional subspace through the entire experiment. And the other one, which is much more classic, is the idea of the neural sequences. So now you don't have like a, a population mode that's just increasing and decreasing, right? We have temporal heterogeneity um, from uh, the activation of one neuron to another. And this has already been pointed out. So here's a paper from Mark Churchill's group, uh, where they show that if you take the data tensor and you just um, basically turn it into a matrix, but in different ways, so you either unfold it across conditions or you unfold it across um, neurons, then different regions actually uh, perform better when you do PCA on those different uh, matrix unfoldings of the data tensor. And so these choices actually make a difference. Okay, so in order to um, relax the assumptions on TCA, we look back at what a, a rank one tensor is. So this is a generalization of a rank one matrix, which is an outer product of three vectors for a three tensor. Um, but it's not the only generalization we could do. And we could use something called the slice rank, which was uh, recently, um, relatively recently developed by, um, this is a, a, a Terry Tuff blog of all places. Um, and the basic idea is that the, um, the uh, slice rank one tensor in this example is the outer product of the matrix. Um, and the vector. And so of course, depending on which of these different lengths of the tensor um, is defined as that um, loading vector, you have three different possibilities for a slice rank one tensor. And so this is basically the idea that we have is to use this definition for a low rank tensor approximation. Um, and what we think from the neural um, point of view, what's interesting is that these different uh, slice rank one tensors represent different types of covariability. So in the first example, um, you have covariability across the neurons. So this is just like if you do regular PCA, the normal way that you would do it, where you just concatenate over trials. You have some characteristic neural weights, and the time series can vary for the scores that can vary over time and trials in some arbitrary way. 
And if you just fit this one um, slice rank one tensor, you're basically doing a matrix factorization and just doing PCA. So it gets interesting when you start considering the other um, types of uh, slice rank one components, the other covariant voting classes. Um, so here now we have the loading vector is the trial weights. Um, and so we have characteristic trial weights, um, but the uh, time series um, for the slice will vary from now to now. And so now you can capture things like sequences or temporal basis functions. And then the third example, uh, you have a characteristic time series, but the neural coding weights are working from trial to trial. And so it turns out that each of these three different rank one tensors is defining um, a different covariate building class. If you only capture one of these, you're, you're doing a matrix factorization method, but you can capture them all at the same time with um, slice TCA. So that's the basic idea, um, is that we have a, a, a new tensor decomposition that includes each of these different covariate building classes. Um, yeah, and so just to make this explicit, the relationship between all of these different methods, so uh, if you think about each covariate building class, um, PCA or matrix factorization on a, a tensor unfolding um, would correspond to one of these different um, types of covariability. If you um, uh, use the TCA, that's actually the intersection. I think I have, yeah, that's right, I have schematic here. So, um, yeah, so if you only look at one covariability class, you're just doing uh, matrix factorization. Um, if you look at um, all possible covariability classes, um, then that slice TCA. And it, it actually turns out that TCA, it, normal TCA, is the intersection. Because if you think about this component, you can write it as any of these three different forms. And so it has to fit in all three of these covariability classes simultaneously. And if you think about where, what this really means um, in terms of, uh, you know, like what, where could you get these different types of covariability, this is a very, very simple example that we cooked up it's a slice rank uh, two example. Um, and basically, you've got like a, a feed forward model um, that receives um, sensory input and top down input. So it's kind of a model of perceptual decision making, although it's um, very, very simple. Um, and the, so basically, there's um, sensory inputs related to the go and no go stimulus, and they potentiate or depress um, if it's a go and no go trial. And you also have top down inputs that are not um, associated with anything in the in the sensory stimulus and maybe attention or behavior, for example, some top-down modulation. And so you have two different types of input in this example. We have feed-forward sensory input that has a characteristic temporal profile, but the weights are going to vary across uh, neurons and trials if we just add some heterogeneity in the, in the learning rates. And on the other hand, we have top-down modulation, which has characteristic neural weights, but the temporal profile varies on each trial um, because it's not related to the the experiment that, or you know, the task structure. So you can see from this example that you have, uh, basically it's, it's cooked up so that it's a slice rank two um, uh, tensor where you have um, uh, the sensory input is the uh, time slicing and the um, top down uh, modulation is the time slicing. And not surprisingly, <laughs> this is an example that we're showing to give you some intuition. Um, you are able to capture this in two components with slice TCA in black, and you need many, many more components if you use TCA or if you use PCA on different unfoldings of the tensor. All right, so that's just to give you a little bit of intuition about the different covariability classes, and I'll jump right into data applications. Um, so the first one is from the latest variable benchmarking data set. So this is uh, data from Mark Church's lab. It's a maze reaching task. Recordings from PMD and M1 and monkeys. Uh, so there's the maze condition where they have to go around the barriers, so you get these curved reaches, and then there's the no maze conditions where you have to go straight to the same targets. Um, okay, so here's the hand positions of the two different uh, conditions. And all I'm going to do um, uh, is I'm going to try to decode with OLS the, um, the hand position from the population data. And if you do this uh, with uh, the trial average data, so we're averaging all trials for the same condition, and then we do this decoding procedure, you get pretty good um, average trajectories from the average um, activation. Uh, but the, the problem is that if you try to do this on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, the raw data, you, you don't really do very well. And that seems to suggest that there's a lot of neural variability that's not related 
um, necessarily uh, to this um, the kinematics of the movement. And so the next question you might ask is, well, maybe it's just you know something that is noise, and we can denoise it using PCA, or in this case, we actually did MNF because um, it, we're just using non-negative uh, methods here. But same idea, we have um, uh, 12 components: uh, neuron slicing and MNF. And you can see this is worse, so that uh, variability is actually important. If you do TCA, you do pretty well, um, and you're able to see some of that structure. But it turns out that we could actually just do NMF, but on a different unfolding of the data tensor. So now it's still NMF, it's not even sliced TCA yet. And you can see that there's a lot of structure that you can find in a very good uh, mapping of GD hand positions. Um, okay, so just a, uh, sorry to chat in. This is a reviewer asked us to do this. I particularly want to make a comparison to LFADS, but. Um, it turns out if you compare it to LFADs, because they had um, uh, applied it to the same data set, uh, you actually do slightly better for curved reaches um, with sliced TCA or even with this, um, uh, you, you get the same performance with the, this example of the end of trial slicing and math. So it's just a point to say that um, you know, these very complicated methods are, are great, but you don't necessarily always need them. Depends on the, the question. Okay, so. Um, that's all for, well, I mean, that, that wasn't even really sliced TCA. That was just kind of on a different uh, uh, matrix. So um, what do we get by adding another slice type? So what we've done is um, basically to take the um, 12 components, uh, trial slicing on enough, and we just add a single component um, of a different uh, co-variability class. And specifically, we're going to add uh, the component from the, uh, the time slicing. The reason is because it's uh, motor cortical data and uh, PMD data. So we expect that there might be some kind of preparatory signal um, that is related to um, the upcoming reach. Uh, that will have high activation before uh, the movement. Um, that is going to be the same um, across neurons and across trials. So we're looking for this preparatory um, signal. Okay, first, this is what the trial slicing components look like. Um, so, uh, on the left is one trial slicing component showing that it's very tuned to specific um, reach directions in the no maze condition. Um, and you can see at the bottom, this is the neuron by time um, slice that's found, as well as uh, slice TCA, and there's um, a sequential activation around the time of uh, motor um, onset, which is at time zero. If you look at another trial slicing component on the right, it's also tuned to specific um, uh, reach directions, but the uh, sequential dynamics is um, shuffled. So this is all you know, the same sorting of the neurons from left and right. So the trial slicing components are picking up um, reach direction specific uh, sequences. And we also have a supplementary figure where we show that the sequences are cross-validated. Um, if you do it on half the data set and the other half the data set, you get the same uh, sequences. Okay, so if we look at the time slicing component, indeed we see that there is high activation at, uh, before time zero, which is uh, motor onset, um, and then it goes to zero. And here's the uh, matrix corresponding to the neural encodings um, across different trials. Um, and in order to really be a preparatory signal, we also expect that the encoding should have some information about the upcoming kinematics. Um, so what we uh, do is if, if we just perform the same decoding analysis on this component, you can already see that has information about the upcoming um, uh, uh, endpoints. And then what we did is to split um, the data into PMD and M1. And we do um, a representational similarity analysis on this um, Slice. So we're looking at how, um, basically looking at the correlation between the rows to see if you have similar encoding vectors um, for different trials that have maybe the same condition. You see there's a lot of structure in the uh, correlation matrix that similar um, reach directions have similar neural encodings in PMD. If you do the same thing in M1, you see that the structure um, is totally gone, which is consistent with what we know about um, motor preparation being mainly in PMD. And also this particular um, component 
uh, uh, explains more variability in PMG than in MMO. So this is our evidence that um, even though you, you do very well with the behavioral decoding with, uh, with just with NMF, by adding another component of a different co-variability class and demixing with slice TCA, you're able to get a different type of information um, from that data set that's related to the preparatory information, not the actual behavioral kinematics. All right, so that was hopefully that um, convinced you that slice TCA is interesting. Uh, there are many practical issues, as there always are with dimensionality reduction methods. So I'm not going to go over how we solve um, the first one. We basically just do a cross validated grid search of the number of components of each. It's not it's not very um, uh, theoretically interesting, but it's very important. And then the second one is uh, both interesting and theoretically both theoretically interesting and important, which is how do you identify a unique solution? And it turns out that there are two different um, uh, invariance classes in size TCA. So the first one is inherited by its uh, relationship to matrix factorizations. So I said if you are only looking at um, a single slice type, um, so if you only look at the, um, for example, you have here you have two neuron, say two neuron um, slicing components and one time slicing component. If you put the two neuron slicing components together, you can just like unfold this uh, slice at the top into a very long vector. And then it's just a, like a matrix factorization. You can do the same thing as uh, factor rotations. So you've got some weights that some scores for this particular um, subtensor made of these components. Uh, just stick in the F, F inverse, and there's your problem already. So you have um, already one invariant transformation. This has uh, already been studied very well in uh, matrix factorization, so we can use methods from matrix factorizations to solve it. Okay, interestingly though, there's a second invariant transformation that is specific to slice TCA. And you can, it turns out that you can actually transfer rank one tensors between different slice types. Um, so let's say we start with a tensor that's the sum of two different components of two different slice types. So the game we're gonna play is we're gonna add and subtract a tensor rank one tensor that has the same loading vectors um, in the two loading vectors um, of the two different components. We're going to stick one in one, stick one in the other, right? So we just associate it with, um, with one or with the other uh, component, and then we can rewrite this as another, um, basically, this, the same um, number of components of each slice type, but now the, the uh, coefficient in the slices have changed. So you have another um, type of uh, invariant transformation, and keep in mind that this third, this third leg of the tensor rank one tensor is arbitrary. So it's like a continuous manifold of solutions if you don't have extra constraints. Okay, so, um, oops, my timer. How long do I have until my timer just stopped? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Sorry, I missed that. Okay. And then back for the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I just have to yeah, just my time back on. Okay, great. So that's just to convince you that we've thought about this. There's some interesting um, properties that you can think about in terms of invariances, and we have a hierarchical multi-stage uh, optimization procedure um, that we describe um, in the in the preprint. Um, that is kind of complex, so I'm not going to um, discuss it here. But you can ask me questions about it, of course. Um, okay, so I am going to go through this section um, a little quick because I want to get to the, the last few parts. But um, basically, we have um, this um, evidence from Mark Churchin's lab that different regions might prefer um, different covariability classes. So we tried this out on the IBL data sets. So this is multi region neural pixel recordings during the ideal task. Um, and uh, we end up getting um, two trial slicing components, three of the other two types. So I just want to quickly show the highlights here. The first trial slicing component we see is picking out uh, correct versus um, error trials. And the second turns out to be um, correlated with your reaction time, although I understand it's not 
It's not as obvious as the first component, but it is uh, statistically significant correlation with the reaction time. And if you look at the neuron testing components, the thing I think is interesting is that it turns out that these three components um, that we find with the cross-validation procedure are identifying three different cortical regions. So, component three, um, hippocampus, um, component four, dentate gyrus, and component five, visual cortex. This is totally unsupervised, so it doesn't have any information um, uh, about um, the different regions, um, uh, but it's able to um, disentangle these three regions and have some um, evidence in the supplementary information that you can only do this if you, dis if you take out the other components of the other slice types. So if you disentangle the behavioral, uh, behavioral variability from the slice type. Okay, in the interest of time, um, we, have, we also have the time testing components. Um, they're less interesting, so I'll go on. All right, so um, yeah, I, I wanted to also come back to this idea of what the time slicing and the trial slicing actually mean. We have this really nice image from one of uh, Byron News Byron Yu and John Kang Young um, uh, review, um, where we know what um, like these matrix factorization methods mean in terms of low dimensional dynamics, but what do the, the time of the trial slicing mean? So if we think about the neuron slicing component, uh, here we're allowing the trajectories to be unconstrained from trial to trial, but they're always embedded in a fixed low dimensional subspace. Um, because it's, it's related to the, the way that we usually do um, PCA. If you look at the time slicing components, so now you have fixed um, trajectories that are embedded in a low dimensional subspace, but the subspace changes from trial to trial because the encoding vectors can change from trial to trial. So that allows you to have um, subspaces that rotate um, in, in different conditions, maybe, or over slow time scales. Um, and if you look at the, the trajectories that are embedded um, in those subspaces, they have to have the same temporal um, dynamics because they have characteristic Time course. And then the final example in the trial sensing component, it turns out that this is because you can capture things like uh, condition specific sequences, you have high dimensional trajectories that have fixed scaling relationships from trial to trial. Um, and it turns out that these, you know, for slice TCA, these um, three different types of latent variable are mixed together, so the reconstruction that you get is actually more complicated than any of these three different um, uh, pictures. So to summarize, um, so we're proposing size TCA, which is a method that captures and makes it three different um, covariability classes. Um, I've shown that behavioral information is distributed across these covariability classes, um, so that's one reason that you might want to mix them. Uh, and another reason is because different uh, regions uh, seem to prefer different covariability classes, and so if you have multi-region uh, recordings and you want to use all of that data simultaneously without separating it from region to region, this is another reason you might want to um, separate these covariability classes. Okay, and then since uh, since it's a, a workshop, I was asked to talk about limitations of ML tools in neuroscience. So um, I have two minutes, I think, to um, uh, speculate. And I'll specifically talk about dimensionality reduction because that's what I, I work in. Um, and these are the questions that I get from people when I present this project. Why are there so many dimensionality reduction methods? Which one's the right one to use? Which one should I use? What are the failure modes of your method? This is another question I get all the time. And so before talking about the limitations, I want to talk about one area where I think it's really been a success. Um, and this is deep learning tools for close estimation. So this obviously blew up um, recently. And I'll, I just want to highlight the reasons I think that this is a success um, that are maybe a little different for dimensionality reduction method. So first of all, we were able to do this before, right? Like it's a task that's boring and time consuming, but you could do it by hand, and we used to make undergrads do it by hand, right? So it's, it's it, so someone has experience with this. Um, we have full access to the ground truth because you look at a picture, everyone can tell you where the tail of the mouse is. Uh, the failures are very, very easy to observe by non-experts like undergrads. Um, and in essence, we're automating a task that we already know how to do, right? And if you think about dimensionality reduction methods, it's, it's a bit different for each of these points. Um, so it's not particularly time-consuming, but it's hard to do by hand because we don't know how 
um, behaviorally relevant information is encoded in, in uh, large populations of neurons. We have no access to ground truth. There's not even, like, a, we, we just have no idea what the, the true within structure is um, at this point in time. The failures are hard to observe, even by experts, of, of any of these methods. And I have an example in the next slide. And so in some way, it almost seems like we're trying to automate a task that we don't know how to do. So uh, what's the point of that? Um, so we heard interpretability uh, a few times already. Uh, I would argue that the only really well-posed definition of interpretability is not natural interpretability, but that's my opinion. We can argue about it later. Um, and I think that's, this is one direction that's very useful because, um, I mean, I showed what slides. Okay, so apparently my time. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to finish this. Sorry. Um, so uh, we were able to characterize the mathematical invariance classes for SPCA because it's a very, very simple method, um, because it's, it's multilinear. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do that if it was very complicated. I think that's, that's very um, uh, helpful for a method because, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw this paper that came out recently, but PCA is like the gold standard of mathematically interpretable methods, in my opinion. And there's still um, failure cases that, that we can see. <coughs> the, the paper, I will admit, I haven't read yet, but I've heard the paper goes into the mathematical arguments for why you get these phantom oscillations. And I think it's really useful that we're able to do that. Not that we only need mathematically interpretable models, but I think that they're very useful to, to keep um, thinking about. The other um, comment I wanted to make is I, I really see dimensionality reduction methods more as hypothesis generation. So I showed you a particular hypothesis you know, that we get with PCA, and the, another example of different hypothesis that we have with slice TCA, NMF, TCA, ICA, these all have different hypotheses, and I think we need to focus more on the hypotheses um, as opposed to just saying that like, this method is, is good for this case or, um, or this other case. So, this is the last slide. Why are there so many dimensional regression methods? My answer is because they represent different hypotheses, and I think until we really understand how the brain represents behavioral information, there just will be a lot of dimensionality reduction methods. I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, I think that's fine. How we can move forward, I think we can continue to invest in uh, mathematically interpretable methods in addition to less interpretable but more powerful um, deep learning based methods or, or um, machine learning methods. I think both are, are useful. And I think we need to focus on the underlying hypothesis for why we would use one versus another. <coughs>